Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast about nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. Okay, welcome back to the podcast, episode 23, Macro Nature Photography. I wish you could be here right now, sitting here. We've got a beautiful, beautiful day in North Carolina. Um, just a beautiful fall day. I hear the, the birds out back happily uh, calling and singing and coming over to my feeder. Uh, it's been a, a really interesting and fun time so far this fall. Uh, in my world right now, I'm getting ready for next week, a trip to Cataloochee, which is an annual event where I go and photograph the elk. Uh, this year, I'm going during the rut, so I expect a very interesting um, and exciting time. I'm looking forward to that. I'll let you guys know, probably, I may even do a special uh, kind of an in-between podcast on just on just Cataloochee again. Okay, in the news. What's going on in the news? Last week, we talked about the release of the Sigma 150 to 600. I briefly talked about the Sigma 500 millimeter F4. And I just wanted to go ahead. I know it's an expensive lens, but I wanted to go ahead and kind of give you my thoughts and feelings just on the initial specs of this lens. First of all, the it's called the Sigma 500 millimeter F4 DG OS HS Sport. Anything with a sport designator at the end just means it's their professional sports and wildlife lens. Uh, it's weather sealed. It is built ruggedly for wildlife and sports. Um, it lens wise construction wise it has 16 elements and 11 groups so that's 16 pieces of glass in there and 11 different groups or structures it has a nine blade diaphragm for for smoother bokeh uh, it has a minimum aperture of f32 which no one ever uses but it's there it has a filter size of 46 millimeters and that may sound small to you that's because it's a rear filter, which means that you drop the filters actually into the back of the lens or the lens that is closest to the sensor. And that makes it cheaper and frankly easier to use uh, filters. The weight of this lens has actually not been announced. Now I find that interesting. To me that's kind of a, uh, a red flag that they're not fully ready to launch this, this lens yet. I suspect that it will probably be pretty hefty. I think it's going to weigh more than the 150 to 600s. Uh, it may be closer in weight to the 150 to 600 Sport. Uh, that'll be interesting to see. It's coming right now. It's going to ship with uh, the Sigma mount, the Canon mount, or the Nikon mount. Now, the price of this lens is a whopping. Five thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine U.S. dollars. Now, I may not be the greatest mathematician in the world, but that sounds a lot like six thousand dollars to me. So, basically, let's say you have a six thousand dollar lens here. Now, if you know me and you follow this podcast, honestly, that's a lot of cash. I I try to keep my purchases limited to between one thousand and two thousand dollars. I don't like to buy anything really over 2000 I would if it, if I absolutely had to. I buy used and I buy quality equipment at a decent price. So my question to, I guess, to Sigma right now is why? Why now? Why, why the 500 F4? Um, and the reason I asked this question is because they've already introduced a beautiful and I mean beautiful, two beautiful lenses, the, the 150 to 600 Contemporary and the 150 to 600 Sport. And we're talking about significant price difference here. We're talking about a $4,000 price difference off from uh, the, the Sigma 150 to 600 Sport. That's 
very significant. Now, you do pick up an F4 aperture. Now, an F4 aperture, honestly, that's pretty doggone good, right? I mean, uh, one of the reasons that we like to use a small aperture when we can is so that uh, not just in low light scenarios, but but when a lot of light enters your your lens, essentially it makes your autofocus work quicker and easier. So one of the reasons that you see professional cameras have f4 lenses is to actually gather more light for their autofocus systems. So that's one big plus that f4 has. And of course the other big plus we just discussed is the low the low light gathering. I mean you're talking about you know a couple stops here, a stop and a half difference between uh, the Sigma 500 f4 and the uh, 150 to 600 which is an f6.3 aperture so you know that could make a difference is it four thousand dollars difference I don't know I'll leave that up to you honestly uh, the the versatility of the 150 to 600 it's just hard to beat, guys. I mean, when I'm out in the field with that camera, I don't need another lens. I don't need another lens. You know, it, it's... I've actually seen professional photographers, well-known professional photographers that shoot... have have, have been shooting primarily with, uh, you know, 500 millimeter and 600 millimeter primes uh, switch to the Tamron 150 to 600 simply because... It was more versatile. I mean, what would you rather do? Would you rather, you know, say you're photographing, you know, we talked about white-tailed deer last week. Let's say you're you're focus, focusing on a white-tailed deer, and all of a sudden he starts walking toward you, and you've got a 500 millimeter. What are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna put. Hopefully, you've got another one, another lens on another body hanging around your neck. Otherwise, you're gonna miss the shot. Not only that, but actually putting the lens down or the camera down and picking up your other body might scare the animal away. So I'm really excited about the 150 to 600, not so excited about the 500 F4. Okay. Maybe a birder could make use of it. Uh, birds in flight, I think, would be a great use for it. But honestly, come on, guys. You know, that's, that's $5,000 more than my Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary, just to put that in perspective. But hey, if you got the money, go for it. Hey, I would. If I had the money, I'd I'd give it a shot. I'd see what it was like. You know, Sigma, if you want to send me one, I'm more than happy to test it and let you know what I think. They probably won't, but that's okay. Okay, okay, let's get on to the meat of this episode. Macro nature photography. I just want to say right up front, yes, let's get this out of the way. I I go out and shoot macro about three times a year. Okay. I am not a macro expert. I am not a macro genius. I don't own a macro lens even. Uh, we're going to get into that in a minute. So this talk will be geared primarily for those that maybe are wildlife photographers that are wanting to get into macro or maybe that you're a new photographer and you're wanting to get into macro photography this talk will be more geared for them uh, you know you might get something out of it if you're advanced I hope so but that's the primary audience so everyone wants to talk about equipment let's start out there what equipment do I need for macro photography well here's the deal there are several approaches to macro photography equipment wise the first thing that you're going to hear people talk about probably is the macro lens now for the purposes of this discussion I'm going to define macro as photography that is in a one-to-one -one ratio now what do I mean by that I am no mathematician so bear with me macro one-to-one -one is Here's a way to visualize this. If you were to take your sensor out of your camera and hold it in your hand, and you took a, well, let's just say a, uh, a fly, and you held it up 
right next to that sensor. Now this is a full frame sensor. That would be life size or one to one. That's what it would look like if you took a photograph of that of that insect. It would look that big in your finished photograph. It would be you know, that big on the sensor. That's a one to one ratio. You could also call a two to one ratio or three to one ratio uh, macro photography. For the purposes of this discussion, I am not going to call one to three, one to four ratios uh, macro. I know that some may, and that's fine, but I just, I kind of draw the line there myself. It's all arguable and subjective. But I think at the very least, we're talking about a one to one ratio. There are some macro lenses out there, prime lenses, that, that were manufactured years ago. Uh, Vivitar had one out that was actually a one to two macro, and it had a converter that came with it. It maybe came with it. You might have had to buy it separately, but I think it came with it, and that would make it a one to one ratio. Now, there's one thing I want to mention here that you may see. Be very careful with this. This was especially true in the 90s, and it's still true to some degree. When you buy a zoom lens, sometimes it will say macro on the side of it. It will have a macro setting, or uh, on the lens barrel itself, it'll, uh, it'll say macro. And generally, that is not a true macro lens. What they are saying is that, let me see if I can put this in perspective. Many years ago, when you buy a prime, when you bought a prime telephoto lens, the focusing distance was was not good, right? The close fo close focusing distance. So it could be a, a very long ways away from you. Well, when the zoom lenses came out, the very nature of the zoom lens, m the physics of the zoom lens, which I don't pretend to understand, made it so that you could focus closer. And so the, the marketing guys said, wow, we should... Since this focus is closer than most primes in this range, we should definitely put macro on the lens barrel and we can sell more lenses. And honestly, they probably did. The fact of the matter is that these lenses are not true macro lenses. Most of the time they're in the one to four ratio, which means that your subject would be one fourth of your, of your sensor. So, uh, no. No, uh, you know, stay away from that. That is that is not a, a true macro lens. Macro lenses generally come in three focal lengths. You'll find them, in, and you may find other focal lengths as well, but this is the primary focal length. You'll have a 50 millimeter macro, a 100 and 100 millimeter macro, and a 180 millimeter macro. Now... You may think, well, I'm going to go with whatever is the cheapest macro lens. And that would be the 50 millimeter macro. You can pick these up for a couple hundred bucks, maybe even cheaper than that. And it is true that they will produce a macro photograph at one to one. What they don't tell you is that in order to do that, you need to have that lens right up on the subject. I mean, very, very close to the subject. And so that won't work for nature photography many times. If you're photographing a flower, it might work. If you're photographing a grasshopper or a spider or a bee, that's not going to be very convenient, right? You're probably the subject's going to fly away or crawl away. And so... For nature, I don't recommend the 50 millimeter macro. The most popular macro size is probably the 100 millimeter macro. The 100 millimeter macro gets you a little farther away, so you know roughly twice the distance away from the 50 millimeter macro, and so you know you're a little bit farther away from the subject. And they're another step up dollar wise. I think that you can get them for about $500. And, you know, all the major manufacturers uh, make macros in these ranges. Uh, Canon, Nikon, Sigma, Tamron. So you can find them in any company. 
The 180 millimeter macro is probably the choice of most insect photographers because it gives you the most working distance from your subject. You're going to have a subject that's not in fight or flight mode and you're going to be able to comfortably photograph that subject. So if you're, if you're going to be serious about macro and you know for a fact you're going to stay with it and not look back, I would definitely spend the extra money. And I think you're approaching the $900 range here with a 180 millimeter macro. But honestly, it's money well spent um, if you're going to do it full time. If you're not going to do it full time, I would lean more toward the 100 millimeter macro. It's cheaper and it's generally going to do what you want it to do. Interestingly enough, what makes a macro great also is not its close focusing, but the quality. Macro lenses are known to be extremely sharp. The 100 millimeter Canon, for example, is a phenomenal, phenomenal lens. It, it is tack sharp. I used one several weeks back um, that a friend of mine had, and we, we messed around with it over at his house one day, and it's incredibly, incredibly sharp. And that was just the Canon 100 millimeter uh, macro non-L version. So they're incredibly sharp because the, then there's a reason for that, right? I mean, when you're taking photographs of of an insect, for example, close up, what do you want? I, you know, I want to see the hairs on his legs. I want to see his compound eyes. I want to see every little detail. And so the manufacturers know this. They know they're not going to sell very many macro lenses if they can't resolve detail. So the resolution on these lenses is phenomenal. And a lot of people, frankly, many people buy the 100 millimeter macro for head and shoulder portraits because it's so sharp and it, it compresses the face of your subject uh, if you're doing portraits. So if, you know, for instance, if, if your model had a long nose, it compresses that just like any telephoto lens would do. And so it's, it's desirable even outside of the macro world. So that's the macro lenses. They range, like I said, anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. And that's for the person that wants a no hassle, great experience with macro photography. Now, the second, well, I mean, let's talk about the cons a little bit, right? There's gotta be some cons with the macro lens. Uh, there really isn't too many. The, the biggest con, of course, is, is expense. They're very expensive. And the other con, of course, is weight. You know, it's another lens, and lenses are heavy. So it's one more lens in your bag. And if you're not a serious uh, macro photographer, you may not want that extra weight. And there are other options we're going to talk about here in a second. The next option that you have, so first you've got macro lenses. Second, we have something called extension tubes. Now, extension tubes are actually what I use for macro photography. What an extension tube is, very simply, it's probably one of the simplest pieces of gear that you can buy. It is simply a tube. It is literally a tube. It's like somebody took a lens, smashed out the glass, and just left the barrel there. So that's what an extension tube is. In essence, it's a spacer between your sensor and the rear element of your lens. You can attach these to any lens and you buy you simply buy the extension tube that's made for your your system, like EF mount or E mount or you know Nikon mount, whatever. And generally the newer extension tubes have uh, communication uh, pins so you they can communicate with your camera and tell it, you know, what aperture you're at and so on and so forth. But that's all it is. And they're very cheap. You can buy extension tubes for 50 bucks, a whole set of them for 50 or $75. And you're in business. And this is the, this is the path that I recommend that people go when they're just getting into to macro photography. Because, you, you know, you may not even like macro photography. Why go out there and spend $180 on a macro lens when you don't need to? Uh, extension tubes come in different millimeters. The, the set that I have has a 12 millimeter tube. 
a 20 millimeter tube and a 36 millimeter tube. Now you can buy plain extension tubes much, much cheaper. They do not communicate with your camera. I do not recommend them. Go ahead and spend the money, get yourself a decent set of extension tubes. You can go out to my website and look at my gear page and you'll see what I use for extension tubes. Um, Kenko makes some good extension tubes. Uh, I think Photodiox makes some. Um, so there's a there's a plethora of different ones to choose from out there. So what's the pros? The pros, they're cheap, right? We already talked about that. 50 to 75 bucks. There's no image de image degradation. So there's, you know, the image still looks good. There's not there's nothing lost there. Um, and they easily convert any lens into a macro or semi-macro lens. What are the cons? Well, there's one big con with using extension tubes. Extension tubes soak up light. So that distance, that space be that they make between your rear element of your lens and your sensor makes it a farther distance for light to travel from your lens to your sensor. Because of that, oftentimes you have to open up a stop or two and that might mean the difference between getting a shot and not getting a shot, quite honestly. Because it may mean that you're either going to have to bump up your ISO or your shutter speed will be so low that you will not be able to get a good shot. So that's the biggest con. The other con is, and it's not necessarily an extension tube problem, is that not all lenses make good macro lenses. You may have a great zoom lens that takes fairly sharp images, but what you didn't notice was that when you put an extension tube on it, it magnifies that image and you may find that there are things about your lens that you don't like. It also magnifies the image and any kind of inconsistencies in your lens, any kind of... Uh, softness in your image will be magnified. So that is possibly a problem for you, right? My feeling on that is, hey, if you can zoom into your image, if you take an image with your with your zoom lens and you can zoom into it um, to 100% and it's tack sharp, you will not have any problems with an extension tube. However, if you zoom into 100% and it might be a little fuzzy, you know, it may not be tack sharp. You may notice some inconsistencies uh, when you're using an extension tube. So please take that into consideration. I have been known to use my 50 millimeter Canon 50 millimeter 1.8 lens with extension tubes with no problems. Again, the caveat there is 50 millimeters, you got to be right on top of your subject. Do take that into consideration. I also use my zoom lenses with it. I will actually use my zoom lenses. And I can get a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. Actually, if you go out to my website, I think it's still out on my main page. If you sc scroll through the, the images there, you'll find one of a of a bumblebee that I took recently. And, that, and that's a very close close-up. Um, it's Actually, it's probably more than a one-to-one -one ratio. It might be closer to two two to one um, with extension tubes. And I shot that with a 70 to 300 Tamron. Now that's that's pushing that lens pretty hard. I gotta be honest with you. It it it, it took a little bit of sharpening on that one. Um, I think you'd be okay with a 70 to 200 L from Canon. I think that'd make a good macro. Um, I think uh, really, really any sharp lens would be fine for extension tubes. So that's the second type of way you can create macro photographs. The third type is, frankly, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I don't recommend them, and they are called close-up filters. Close-up filters are pretty much exactly what you think they are. They are a magnifier. It's, it's like taking a giant magnifying glass and putting it inside a filter ring 
and then screwing that on the front of your lens. And they come in different diopters. There's like plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on. And they're just different magnifications. And they do work. But I have found that they are problematic. Uh, first and foremost, I find that the edges get very, very uh, unsharp. It, it's very the depth of field is just dramatically exaggerated when using these close-up filters. The pros are they're cheap. Okay, they're dirt cheap. Again, you're talking like a fifty-dollar investment for a set of close-up filters, maybe from Tiffin or something. They easily convert any lens into a macro lens, so that's another benefit similar to extension tubes that's pretty much it right there other than that they're they're easy to store you can put them in a filter pouch or something like that the cons though are pretty significant they the edges like i said very unsharp there's an image definite image quality degradation and i just i'm sorry in today's world i just can't see using them uh, if that offends somebody, I'm sorry. You know, if you're using those at home and you and you like them, go ahead. You know, I, like I said, I mean, if if you're using if anything that I say, if if you're using whatever I'm disagreeing with, you know, and you enjoy it, go ahead and keep using it. I, it doesn't matter to me. I I will not use close-up filters, but if you want to go ahead and try them, uh, go for it. And, and you can get some good shots out of them. Don't get me wrong, especially. I've seen some really interesting stuff done with close-up filters uh, in the whole, uh, what do you call it, the, the abstract space, you know, where you're trying to intentionally create these interesting blurs and weird effects and so forth. So, I, you know, I, I have seen some good images, but, again, just uh, I'd stay clear of them, steer clear of them. Okay, gear, gear conversation done, pretty much. Moving on to technique. I'm going to talk about one more piece of gear, <laughs> but it's, it's more related to technique. I think, um, I'm going to reiterate what probably every other photographer has ever said on their podcasts. And that is get a good tripod. Let me say that again. Get a good tripod. Not only is it important in all areas of photography, but it is super important in macro photography, especially when you're first starting. Like I said, get your, you know, I've, I, I've had this conversation so many times, you're probably tired of hearing it. Get a good man Frodo or an Enduro or something along those lines. You know, Get something that's sturdy, well-made. It'll last you close to a lifetime. You may, you know, you may have to buy another tripod at some point, but you should be able to get a good twenty years out of a tripod. It's it's a it's just an investment that makes sense. Now, why would you need a tripod for macro? It's probably self-explanatory, but for those that may not know. When you're taking a picture of something at a one-to-one -one magnification, every little tiny movement is exaggerated. It's exaggerated to the point that it seems silly. Now, if you want to do a test on this, if you want to test your tripod to see just how good it is, go ahead, get you some extension tubes, put you a couple extension tubes on there, on your lens, attach it to your camera, Put your camera on your tripod. Go to live view mode. Zoom in 2x magnification and just sit and watch it. And what you're going to see probably, especially if you have a bad tripod or a bad uh, head on your tripod, you're going to see vibration. Quite a bit of vibration actually. And the more the wind blows and the more you move and it moves and so on, the more exaggerated it becomes. This is why it's so important to have a good tripod and a good tripod head. So that's number one. The second thing you're going to need under the technique, I guess equipment subheading, is a cable release. I recommend cable releases for this type of photography and there's two reasons I recommend it. One, 
Yes, you can use your self timer also, but I think that the the cable release gives you much more control. You can fire exactly when you want it to be fired. So you might want to wait for a break in the wind, for example. And then you can click your shutter. It just gives you a little more flexibility, I think. There's nothing wrong with using a self-timer. I do it frequently. But if I'm given an option, I will go with my cable release every time. And again, cable releases are cheap. You can buy a cheap Aputure. Yes, it's called Aputure. Aputure. A cable release for about 5 bucks on Amazon. If you want to see what one looks like, head out to my website. Check on the My Gear page and you'll see it. I've had mine for how many years now? Four years maybe, something like that. Okay, now we're totally, totally into technique. I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Get in close, right? We're, We're already shooting a macro subject. Why would we take a photograph far away from the subject? Get your camera in tight so it fills the frame. You should be able to pretty much fill the frame. Let's say you're taking a picture of a, of a bumblebee. You should be able to pretty much fill the frame with that bumblebee. Okay. With a one-to-one ratio. A one-to-one uh, magnification. So that kind of is the first step. you know. And the way that you can do that, especially if you're a beginner, just immediately go to your lens barrel. And turn it all the way to its... Switch to manual focus, by the way. I highly recommend that you use manual focus when shooting macro photography. And honestly, probably, I mean, 9 out of 10 of the great macro photographers use manual focus. Maybe 10 out of 10. I don't know. Everyone that I've talked to uses uh, manual focus or read about or watch videos on. The reason for this is is that with with live view on modern cameras, you can zoom in to, to like maximum magnification on your on your live view and you can critically focus and get just the right focus on that bumblebee. So that's the first thing you're gonna do. Rack your your focus all the way to this closest setting. Turn on live view, okay. And then what I do, and maybe, you know, you may do something a little different, but what I do is I will pick up my entire tripod with the camera on it and I will start moving forward toward my subject and I will watch that live view. And as it, as I get closer, the, hopefully if I'm doing this right, the subject gets sharper and sharper and sharper until it's perfectly sharp. And then I'll set my tripod down. I may need to just tweak focus slightly at that point to get it absolutely critically sharp. I will then set my aperture to a a small opening, like an f-stop of you know f16, f22, and I will focus on the eye of the bee, for example, and I'll fire a shot. That is basic macro technique very basic macro technique what you're going to find is that macro photography is much more involved in than than what i just mentioned to you but to get started and to get headed in the right direction that is a simple macro shot so now you have a focused subject you've taken a shot it's one to one ratio it's filling the frame great you got your first macro shot but Did you watch the background? Backgrounds are extremely, extremely important. Just as important as they are in landscape photography and wildlife photography, they are in macro photography. If you have a busy background with lots of sticks going through it and twigs and blades of grass and all this stuff, suddenly your insect that you're photographing may not even appear to be the main subject. Watch those backgrounds. Keep it clean. Maybe use uh, something like green grass in the background, uh, foliage. But don't 
don't get all kind of crazy backgrounds going on. That's not desirable. I mentioned using a small aperture, but be careful with that because the farther down you go on your aperture, of course, diffraction starts to happen. What happens when you get diffraction? Uh, we've talked about this before. Diffraction is a technical word out there that simply is as the light comes across your small aperture and the way that light bends and so forth around the aperture blades causes a softening of your image. And so when you get up around F22, F32, you will start to see some degradation. Now, if you're using a, a really expensive lens, you may see less degradation. If you're using a cheaper lens, you may see a great deal of softness. And so I, I, I use that as a caveat. Be careful. Be very careful with aperture. When I first started photography many years ago, I did not understand this principle. It wasn't well taught back then. It really wasn't. Maybe it wasn't even well understood. I don't know. But it wasn't well taught. And I could not for the life of me figure out why my scenics were coming out blurry in, in sometimes. And I tracked it down and, and sure enough, it was because I was using too small of an aperture on some of the more inexpensive lenses and it was causing a lot of diffraction. And I'm telling you, that is just not cool. I'd rather have shallow depth of field than diffraction because diffraction is across the whole image shallow depth of field is just parts of the image okay so we got the diffraction thing now what you're going to notice is that having a small aperture is not enough a lot of times if you're photographing a very very close subject let's say you're photographing a spider and you're trying to, to focus on its eyes, you may notice that you can get one eye in focus and not the other, or one eye in focus, but not its front leg. That's because at that distance to your subject, even using an aperture like F22 is not going to give you enough depth of field to cover that whole spider. And back in the 1990s and 80s and 70s and so on, that was a deal breaker. Right? I mean, you just had to deal with it. There was no other option. Well, in today's world, we have this magical thing called Photoshop. And what it allows you to do, what you can do when you're in the field, is you can actually, let's say you, you know your camera's sweet spot, or your lens's sweet spot, excuse me. You know it's F8. You know that this makes the sharpest images at F8. But what you can do is you can do what's called focus stacking. Let's say I had that spider and I took a picture at F22 and I said, oh man, you know, the eye's in focus, the leg's not in focus. How do I solve this problem? It's actually not that difficult in today's world. You can focus on the front leg and take a photograph. You can focus on the end of the leg and take a photograph. You can focus on the eye and take a photograph. You can then focus on the thorax and take a photograph. You can focus on the weed that he's clinging to and then take a photograph. And then later on, you can use special software like Photoshop or other third-party apps out there. And you can stack these together. And it will create one image based on all those different focus points. And it will look like you have infinite depth of field in your image. That's pretty darn cool, folks. And if you want to see it again, I used uh, focus stacking on the Bumblebee image out there on my homepage. I I can't live without focus stacking these days. I'm absolutely absolutely in love with focus stacking. And I don't just use it in macro. It, it actually comes in handy in a lot of different genres. When I'm photographing um, still lifes, for example, I will oftentimes uh, do a still life where I'm shooting straight down onto a tabletop. And I will use it. I will set my camera to f8 or my lens. I don't know why I keep saying camera. I guess you are setting your camera too. But uh, I will set my lens to f8. And um, I will take several images and I'll stack them together in Photoshop. And I can have everything in focus from the from the top of a, of a glass or a bottle 
all the way down to the tabletop itself. And that is something that we just could not do 20 years ago. And so you know, this is a perfect example of, of how much technology has helped us as photographers to realize our vision and creativity. Okay, let's move on now to lighting. What in the world am I going to do to light my subject? Um, well, first of all, there's the good old-fashioned sun. You know, that big ball of fire up there we see every day. That generally will work uh, as long as you have good side lighting or frontal lighting or something like that. You're going to illuminate that spider pretty doggone well. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing before we get into this. I almost forgot. One thing you need to be very careful with with focus stacking. Sorry to go back on you here, but this is very important. Focus stacking can be problematic with moving creatures. Uh, if you're, I had this happen to me when I was photographing a garden spider one day. And it looked like the garden spider wasn't moving. But in reality, he was moving very, very, very slowly. And so I created like 20, 20 images and I was going to stack them. Went back to my software to stack them. And when, he, when I got done with it, he had 10 legs, not 8 legs. And I said to myself, ain't no spider that has 10 legs. What I realized was that he had actually moved. In, one of the, in two or three of the images, he had actually moved his legs slightly. You, could barely, you couldn't even see it when I was taking the shots. So you can still use them. You just either you have to clone out the extra legs or have a spider from Mars or something. Um, but that's something to be aware of. It, it generally, focus stacking works really well with, with static subjects. Like, I mean, the spider might work for you if you got him early enough in the morning where he's not moving very well or a grasshopper with dew or something like that. It would work very well in that situation or flowers or, you know, leaves or so on and so forth. Incidentally, although I am only, I only photograph macro a few times a year. I really do enjoy it. I forgot to mention that. I mean, I think that's kind of important. I really do enjoy macro photography and hopefully I can do more of it in, in the coming years. I, I only do it the reason I only do it several times a year is simply because uh, right now I have more of an emphasis on, on wildlife. So that's that's kind of my thing right now. But I, I think I could really make a make a go at, at macro. I really, really enjoy it. Okay, let's move on to lighting. Say so we're talking about the sun. And the sun works a lot. I recommend using the sun when you first start. Um, don't get carried away. Don't get crazy. Uh, start simple. Work your way up. Don't have you know forty-five strobes and reflectors and all that stuff. Start out simple. Get you get your extension tubes. Get you some sunshine and and go at it. Um, when you are ready, when you ha are ready to graduate, there are multiple types of lighting scenarios. Um, one, of course, I just mentioned was a uh, reflector uh, reflectors allow you to actually take the sunlight reflect it back into your subject and essentially fill in all the shadows uh, reflectors are handy reflectors make great macro lighting devices but what most macro photographers will will use at one time or another especially in the nature realm is a flash now you definitely want to have your flash off camera that's my recommendation Others may disagree with me. That's fine. There are multiple flash setups that are possible. There are brackets that you can buy that position your flash at 45 degree angles. Uh, one to your left and one to your right. Um, oftentimes people will use that setup handheld without a tripod because remember what flash can do. Depending on how you're using your flash, flash can freeze your subject or it can add fill light. Okay. And... Depending on what scenario you are trying to use, you can get away with being hand, shooting handheld. If you're using all flash for your main lights, then you can shoot handheld. Some guys will have one of the flashes, one of the 45 degree flashes as a main light. So that will be set at full power or not whatever power they decide on. And then the second flash will be a fill light. 
and they'll have that set to half power or three quarter power to provide a little shadow, um, a little more shadow, a little more uh, uh, detail in their photographs. <clears throat> so there's that approach. The second flash type that you can use is a ring flash. A ring flash, R-I-N-G, ring. It is probably the simplest flash that you can use, okay? It's, it's a little, if you haven't seen one, it looks like a donut, and it's, it attaches to the end of your lens, oftentimes made specifically for lenses. For example, I could be wrong about this, but I believe the Canon 100 macro has a specific ring flash that's made for it, and you can attach it to that lens. It gives you full ETTL support, and it provides a nice, flat, soft image. That could also be a good approach for beginners, and I actually, I know professionals that use it frequently. I think Rick Salmon, I believe Rick Salmon is known to use ring flashes uh, with, with macro subjects. So that's a, another valid approach. The other thing that people will do to kind of soften up their image is they will use miniature soft boxes. And you can go out on my website. I've, I actually use one of these. And what it does is it, it's, it's just this soft box that Velcros to the, your flash head. And it may, essentially it makes the small light a big light. So that's all that soft boxes do. They turn a smaller, tighter light source into a bigger, softer light source. So the same thing applies here, right? If you've got this massive mini softbox on there and you're, you know, it's actually small for us, but when you're photographing an insect, that is a massive light source, right? Compared to his little tiny insect body, that is a massive softbox. And so it will, it will provide a very soft lighting. Now, that may not be what you want. You may want a more dramatic effect. You may not want the soft. You may want to leave the soft box off. You may want some dramatic side lighting that uh, <clears throat> emphasizes the form of, of, the, uh, of the subject. So that's pretty much that. I mean, that is basic macro photography. The other thing that I probably need to mention is ISO. Now, I'm told it's actually called ISO now. When I was going through, we all called it ISO. But Tony Northrup tells me that I'm supposed to call it ISO now. So I'm going to call it ISO sometimes when I feel like it. Um, apparently, ISO actually means nothing. It does not mean International Standards Organization anymore, apparently. Or never did. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, ISO in, in macro photography... Is, is pretty much the way it is in any photography. You want to, to find the lowest ISO or ISO that you can. Why? Because the lower ISOs at 100 and 200 are going to provide a much more detailed, much sharper, more dramatic image than one shot at ISO 1600. You're going to have less noise it's going to look better okay it just is yes the cameras now can do phenomenal things at iso 800 and iso 1600 but why do it when you want the maximum quality so this is another reason that people will use flashes is so that they can use a lower iso or iso this is where things get complicated, and, and, and this is why I recommend that people start out simple. Start out with your extension tubes. Start out with a nice tripod. Start out with natural light. You've, you've kept it simple at this point. Once you introduce strobes, then you're, you're moving into the advanced world, and with it comes many, many more responsibilities. Uh, keep it simple. Keep it interesting. Then as you move forward, you'll start to realize, you know, this, uh, this grasshopper would have looked a lot better if some of those shadows were filled in. I should I'm going to try using a flash next time. Now that's where you, you've recognized that you start to, you recognize that you need something. 
And once you recognize that need, then introduce it. Then and only then. So let's talk about troubleshooting a little bit. What ha Okay, you're out, you're photographing the grasshopper. It's got dew on it. It's beautiful. You're like, oh, you're so excited. You're, you're firing away shots. You're, you're getting, you're fr filling the frame. You get back home and you look at them and they look terrible. Because sometimes the LCD on the back of your camera will lie to you. You'll think you have a sharp image and you don't. What happened? Why did you get an unsharp image? Okay, let's backtrack. Do you have let's ask the, the let's ask the fundamental questions. Do you have a good tripod? Yes. Okay, so it's, it may not be the tripod. Do you have a good tripod head? Yes. Okay, good. What was your shutter speed? This is one of those things where you need a good shutter speed. Well, come to find out you're shooting at a 15th of a second. Well, that's not going to work, guys. Generally speaking, unless you're indoor with with like no movement whatsoever, the air conditioners are off, everything is silent. Are you going to be able to use 1 15th of a second? If you're an outdoor photographer, 1 15th of a second is your enemy. I'll just be honest. It is your enemy. Do not rely on image stabilization. Rely on good old fashioned smarts. One fifteenth of a second is your enemy. Okay, so you go back out again and you're like, okay, I got to get my shutter speed up. So maybe you bump up your ISO a little bit or your ISO. You bump up your ISO a little bit and you retake the shot and you come back and it's still not in focus. What's going on? It still looks blurry. It could be a couple of things at this point. Could be your focus. You really need to check your focus. Focus and focus again. That is, that is my mantra. When I go out and I shoot, I focus and I focus again. And then sometimes I focus and I focus again. You want to make sure that that is dead on. Focus has got to be right. So that could be the culprit. But it could be diffraction, right? If you're shooting at f32 and you got an inexpensive lens, it could be diffraction. Okay, that could be a serious problem. So you may want to back off your, your aperture to f8 or f, f11, f16. And this goes back to just trial and error and knowing your equipment and knowing what your equipment can do. Okay, so you, you've got that scenario. So you go back out and sure enough, you come back and it's it's all in focus and it looks good. You, you did it. You made the shot, but you notice that half the image is out of focus. Well, there's a couple things here too you can check. Make sure that you are on plane with your subject. What does that mean? Well... If you are taking a shot of a garden spider, for example, and he is, uh, you know, garden spiders will generally be in the middle of the web, and they generally are perpendicular uh, to the to whatever object they are on. So, if if for instance they were if they were uh, had a web across your house, they would be perpendicular or parallel, actually not perpendicular, parallel to your house. See, I'm not a good math student. I already told you this. They would be parallel to your house. So what else needs to be parallel to the subject? Your camera, right? You need to have a parallel plane of your sensor. That's something you can check. Because if you if you have it at an angle, then maybe, again, maybe his leg's in focus and the eye's not, or the eye's in focus and the wing is out of focus or... So there's that, right? The other thing is you may just need to use um, focus stacking and just and and use that to, to solve your uh, depth of field problems. So that's some of the like the, some of the things you can look for. But I mean, nine times out of ten, when I have a problem in the field with with blurriness, it's it's usually it's usually shutter speed. Honestly, I'm we're always fighting that battle of light versus shutter. And, and this is a perfect example. So, 
Um, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the basics. I mean, maybe we can do an advanced podcast at some point when I do a little more. I mean, like I said, I'm not uh, I'm not a macro only guy, and so uh, I can get you started. I can get you pointed in the right direction. I can get you taking some pretty doggone good shots. But eventually, you're gonna want to, you know, find somebody out there that can really tutor you and and take you to the next level. Okay, today's Know Your Subject is on the Summer Tanninger. The Summer Tanninger. According to Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, the Summer Tanningers are medium-sized, chunky songbirds with big bodies and big heads. They have large, thick, blunt-tipped bills. The adult male Summer Tanninger are entirely bright red, Females and immature males are bright yellow-green, which I find very interesting. It's not very unusual. Uh, They're yellow around the head and underparts and slightly greener on the back and wings. The bill is pale. The molting immature males can be patchy yellow and red. Summer tanagers tend to stay fairly high in the forest canopy where they sit still and then sally out to catch flying insects in midair or move slowly along tree branches to glean food. Males have a sweet whistling song similar to an American robin. Both sexes give a distinctive pit t tuck call note. By the way, I never understood the whole... Uh, this is kind of an aside here. But are, are the are the like written pronunciations for birds probably the stupidest thing you've ever seen in your life? Um, I, I, I still don't get that. How can you, without special marks of pronunciation marks and so forth. How can you actually write that out? That's probably the dumbest thing I've ever seen. If anything, they should use musical notation or something. Anyway, that's just a pet peeve of mine. Okay, so how do you photograph the summer tanager? Well, I'll tell you one way you can photograph them. You can go to the zoo. (laughs) We actually have them here in the North Carolina Zoo, and they can be photographed there. However, if you do live in an area where you can photograph them, They are insect eaters primarily, and that's problematic for us. It's very difficult for photographers to lure insect-eating birds. Um, You could try putting out like some some mealworms and things like that, Um, but I think the the best way to to lure in tanagers is with berries, uh, various types of berries, and you can cut those open. You know, put them out on a on a platform feeder and hopefully lure some in. I I have had limited success with using berries for for birds. Um, it, it's a very difficult proposition, but you know you can do it. Uh, the problem with tanagers, summer tanagers, is that they are way up in the trees. Um, they tend to stay up in the top, very tops of the trees, and that's why most people don't see them. We actually have them here in North Carolina. I very, very rarely see them. So that's a big challenge for you. I want to challenge you to go get some great photographs of summer tanagers. Uh, and by all means, share them with everyone. You know, I, Maybe we need to get a, I don't know, maybe we need to have a, a place where all of us can go and, and just show our photographs. Not Flickr or somewhere like that. Maybe like a, a Slack site or a, a Facebook page or something like that where we can all share our photographs together and... and and you know, get some critiquing and and share how we did it and so forth because I think that's valuable. I really do. I, you know, I don't care if you took a, the worst picture in the world. You know, how you took it and where you took it and uh, what techniques you used. I, I think that's very valuable for all of us. And this is a perfect example where you know you may have an inside line on the summer tanager that others don't, and you could share that. So let me know if that's something you guys want. I you know I, I'm open for anything. I'd love to get some more community community involvement here um, and just not have me talking every every episode. I am trying to line up some interviews. Uh, hopefully we'll have those coming soon. But um, yeah, this, the summer tanager, uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's kind of like bluebirds, but harder. You know, bluebirds primarily eat uh, worms as well and they're uh, uh, insects and, and so forth. And they're hard. They're hard to photograph, but 
it's doable. Okay, so yeah, um, I want to encourage you before we leave. Uh, go check out um, my latest book, Reflections of the Creator. Uh, it's available um, blurb for three dollars and ninety nine cents. Not a deal breaker. Easily purchased. Uh, the proceeds for that, of course, will help benefit this show, my website, trying to keep the bandwidth needed for uh, uh, for putting all these podcasts together. So I'd appreciate any kind of uh, contributions that way. Uh, you can give uh, to the podcast through Patreon. I'll have links in the show notes to that. And uh, again, guys, just um, keep spreading the word. I mean, wow. I, I, do you know? Do you know? that this podcast grew about, what was it, about 400% from the second quarter of this year to the third quarter of this year. And I bet you it was because you guys were out there. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm just a, I'm just a schmo out here, you know, trying to help people when I can. But I think it was from you guys just spreading the word, and I really, really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. Um, this, this show is not about making money. You know that I don't, I don't make any money off this. I don't make money off my photography much. Like I said, I'm a semi pro. I make, you know, I get things published here, things published there, but nowhere near a living. And, uh, it's, it's humbling to see, uh, what you guys are able to do and what we can do together, you know, through this podcast. I did want to leave you with one quote from David Dushman. By the way, David Dushman is an incredible author. Go check out his stuff. Um, very inspirational. Uh, what he said in a, in a beautiful anarchy, he said this, No one can do it all, but the pressure to try is paralyzing. And so we say yes to a million efforts that pull us in a million directions and say no to the most important things in our lives by our refusal to give them the time they need. Thanks for listening, make it a great day, and get out there and enjoy nature. Bye-bye. Music for this episode was provided by Dr. Turtle.